Gracias. Uh, si me permiten, yo voy a hablar en inglés porque los temas técnicos para mí me salen mejor en inglés. Perdón. Eh? Um, well, first, thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I think at this part of the, the workshop, we're shifting a bit the, the topic in order to bring a bit some notions of how to make entities created within a Red Plus system more appealing to the private sector, for private sector engagement. Uh, in particular, the topic is investable entities for Red Plus. So um, when we think about Red Plus entities that could be designed as investable entities, I think we should think essentially of two main characteristics or features. First, that this entity, that it is able to navigate and is also able to understand the many uh, different multilateral, bilateral, and domestic access modalities for public budgetary funding. And also, of course, have the capacity, the absorption capacity of receiving those funds and then employing it well. That's one key characteristic. characteristic. The other one I would say is, is the ability to attract private sector participation and private sector finance. And I think this is what this talk will be about. Um, we all know that public funding is limited vis-a-vis uh, -vis the task and the amount of finance that is needed to implement Red Plus. We also know that public funding is normal, normally disbursed for um, readiness and preparatory activities for Red Plus design and for climate finance governance structures. So it is, it is very important now that governments are looking into institutions and now they are looking to governance that they think of creating institutions or redesigning institutions maybe one or maybe a set of institutions that have some particular characteristics of a private regime that allows them to source private finance in a way that goes a bit beyond the standards of donations, of grants, of capacity building, and other types of non-reimbursable instruments. Um, it is true that this, this market, a Red Plus market, or a forestry economy, or a a rural sustainable economy, they are still at its infancy. But it is also true there is a steadily growing interest out there by the private sector to engage in those activities, right? And this interest is not limited to essentially carbon credits or offsetting of emissions, it goes beyond that. I mean, we have been seeing a number of possibilities linked to um, sustainable or green certification of supply chain, for instance, or new technologies for climate smart agriculture, uh, processing plants and other investments in sustainable fisheries, sustainable rubber production, Brazil nuts, and many other types of, of products, of forestry products. So uh, the idea of this presentation will be exactly to describe a bit how these entities could be changed or could be designed in a way that will make it easier for the private sector to, be, to get involved. Right, so um, public entities can, can make use of different vehicles and, and financing uh, strategies to attract funding, right? Uh, the menu of options they will have at their hands will actually vary depending on whether this public entity operates on a predominantly public law regime or whether it operates on a private law regime. So you see here in this first column that uh, entities, public entities operating under a public law regime, they will be more limited in the forms and, and the manners that it can interact with the private sector. For instance, it will be able to form partnerships, yes, with non-government non organizations, which are non-for-profit, which are non-profit oriented. It will be able to cede, let's say, part of the public services for a private sector entity. 
It also be able to create, for instance, public funds. And that can be made by creating um, an account record in the treasury system, or it could be a new fund, such as a trust fund or an endowment fund, right? But then when you go to the other column and you look at the hybrid entity, the one that is public on, on the way it is born, but it operates on a private law regime, you see that this, this type of entity is allowed to act directly in the forestry economy, and they will have an economic finality. And that makes a whole lot of difference because they will be able, for instance, to enter into partnerships based on equity investments with the private sector. They will be able, for instance, to create new companies operating underneath them, such as what we call in special purpose vehicles that are companies created specifically to develop a certain project or program. They will be able to more easily raise debt. So they will have other types of rules that apply to them and they will be able to issue bonds, for instance, or be able to use their environmental assets as collateral to raise debt with the private sector. Um, coming back now to the public entity that is purely public, you see that um, that entity will be very restricted as well in the way that it can actually spend and disburse resources. And it will also need, for most of its steps, uh, it will need a public procurement procedure or a tender procedure. Right? So if this entity wants to engage in validation and verification services, if it wants to engage with a registry system to track units, or if it wants to sell its carbon credits, those steps will always require a public procurement procedure. This is not entirely bad, but it may be in a market that's still being born, in a market that you don't have that many private players out there disputing for that. When you go to the private side, or well, the public entity operating in a private law regime, you see that depending on the legal system where this entity is created, uh, it will be able to forego some of those very restrictive rules. So for instance, that entity over there would be able to sell Red Plus assets negotiating bilaterally with each potential buyer, rather than having a very cumbersome public tender procedure that may last for months and may also be judicially challenged. So there's a whole set of features here on that second column here that brings more flexibility to the process. And this flexibility is, is likely to be more, uh, or is likely to attract more the interest of the private sector essentially, because the private sector will perceive the, the risks of investing there as being lower. Of course, this is not to say that for public entities, right, purely public entities, that the private sector will not engage with them. They, they, they might and they will, but they will perceive the risks as being higher, and for that they will probably look for instruments such as political risk insurances, some sort of concessional loan on other forms of guarantees that will somehow reduce their exposure in this process. We're now going to give you um, just one concrete example of how an entity could be structured with the features of that second column over there. And that example is the, the example that was established in Acre, Acre being a, a, a state in the northern part of Brazil. Uh, so it's a subnational jurisdiction there, but it, it works the example because it's very advanced and they have been very bold in the way they establish their system. So right there, you see the company or the type of company I'm talking about, it's right here in their structure. It is not a company or an entity that is created in isolation but is created in a system of checks and balances. So there's a number of other institutions there controlling uh, and, and supervising each other at the same time so, so that the whole system functions in, in a sort of efficient manner and balanced manner. So the company, that entity over there, they report to the Acre State 
more specifically, they report to the State uh, Department of Forest. And they also follow the rules of that institute over here, which is the Institute of Climate Change. That's the, the main regulatory authority of that ACRI Red Plus system. And that's the entity that establishes the rules for the programs, that establishes the rules for registration of projects. That's the one endorsing existing methodologies or approving new methodologies. That's the one interacting with the registry system and issuing credits. And we will do all that always with advice coming from the scientific committee and also from inputs from the validation commission. And the validation commission here in the system works as, as the civil society oversight, specifically for issues such as environmental social um, environmental and social safeguards essentially and in that system the idea is that the company there that entity that is public that is created by law but operates on a private law regime is that it acts as the economic arm of the red plus system right so it will be able to interact with investors so here we're not only talking about private sector that are willing to develop Red Plus, Red Plus projects, but also other types of investors that are actually willing to invest in a number of activities that this company can carry out. Uh, among the, competence, the competences of this company, we will see, for instance, the ability to do fundraising, and that include public sources right, of, of funds, but also um, private investment that seeks return on the capital uh, uh, invested. That company will also be able, for instance, to implement and execute programs and sub-programs uh, and also projects associated with Red Plus. They can do that alone or they can do it in partnership of, with the private sector. Um, it is also structured in a way that it can provide advice for private entities, let's say project developers, that want to develop a project and want to do so with the company or want just to receive their device on the best way of doing it. So that company will be able to do that, provide that services as well. And one more important characteristic, according to the law and according to the bylaws of that company, it will be able to manage and, and market and sell environmental assets. And I say environmental assets because the law in itself does not only regulate red, but regulate payment for, for environmental services. And there could be you know, new assets coming along in the future that this company would be able to, to actually manage and perhaps even you know, use it as a way to bring private sector investment in it. Um, so the idea when, when this, this company was envisaged and, and designed was that it, it would bring to the whole system uh, a set of private elements and features that would somehow expand the opportunities for funding, right? So the idea of moving beyond that, that need for, uh, for donations and grants, past of course, this is needed in the initial phases of the, the implementation of the company and of the system, but somehow it would open up vehicles and other types of financing possibilities. And what are the attributes, what are the characteristics of this company, which could be scaled for other types of companies and other types of Red Plus systems, which we should really think of? Well, first of all, it has its own legal personality. Right? A legal personality that is distinct from that of the state. What does that mean? It means that it is essentially able to manage so itself, so it has its own administration. Uh, it is able to have its own list of assets and its own revenues and control those revenues internally within it. And it's also able to sue and be sued. So this is the idea of having a legal personality which is separate from that of the state. Uh, there is also something else which is very important for, for the private sector to be more comfortable with the idea of investing in this forestry economy uh, together with the state is that the notion of legal predictability. 
And why is that? This, this type of entity is still a public entity. So it is created within an entire system, in this case a red plus system. It is created by law. It can only be extincted by law as well. So there is a certain robustness and a certain long-term viability. It is not something that, that with a change of government, the whole thing could fall apart. So the existence of a law and of a system behind it gives it some sort of predictability and some sort of confidence for the private sector that by putting their resources here, they may actually see some results after, you know, 10, 15 years or 20 years. Uh, another point is the economic finality. And what this actually means is that while being a public entity, it is allowed to seek profit, right? And that's another thing that attracts the, the private sector. Of course, the share of profits that this company obtains for itself, it will be recycled back into projects and programs, and that's how the law states, and that's what the bylaws of the company states. But for the private sector, once it achieves a certain sort of result and receives that result, it is able to do whatever it wants with those profits. Right? So the private sector is investing and is looking to return, even if that return is small in the beginning, but at least they know that the investment is, is worth it and they are not actually you know, incurring a loss in the process. This type of company also follow what we call fiduciary standards because it is created in a model, what we call a corporation model or a sociedad de economía mixta, por ejemplo, in, in Espanol in, in some countries. Right? So what that means is that this company will have a board of directors, this board of directors will report to its shareholders and the state will be one of the shareholders. And it will be reporting, for instance, um, on its monthly activities, on its balance sheet, financial flows, financial statements. So all this will follow certain standards of transparency and reporting, which makes the shareholders at ease with the process because they can see what's going on and what decisions that are being made within the company. Um, that other point here on the flexibility to operate, this brings us back to, the, to one of the first slides, which is essentially the ability to forego some of the very restrictive rules on how to spend money, on how to engage in services, and how to, to actually act with the private sector. Of course, each legal system will have its way of dealing with it. I can tell you that administrative law in most of civil law based countries will follow more or less the same standards but of course they have their own nuances and particularities that need to be observed but in most of the cases there will be flexibility for this entity to engage in commercial operations without being too restricted in terms of having to put out public procurement procedures all the time um, Another point of interest that I think that goes back to the first part of the, the workshop here in the morning is that this is not only restricted to Red Plus as the notion that we have of conservation projects and, and, and avoiding deforestation in that sense, but it's also looking at the drivers of that deforestation. So when we talk about um, supply chain green certification process, when we talk about having more efficient systems for agriculture, uh, the idea of climate smart agriculture, for instance, when we talk about um, investing in, in, in you know, rubber production that is a sustainable rubber production, and all those things, they all impact some way in, in deforestation, and they all investments that with some, some good uh, expertise around it, they can be profitable. Uh, more and more, I think that the society is, is actually, and companies and consumers are actually valuing more those types of products. So they have an aggregated value that could be, that could turn this whole thing into a profit. And that's the idea and, and that invest, investors will be looking at when they, they bring their, their expertise and their resources to an entity like this, is that it is not only restricted to certain specific components of Red Plus, but also to other areas related to 
sustainable rural production, for instance. Um, just explain a little bit on how those type of entities could be created. Um, they, are, they are created by law, but actually to correct that statement, they not so much created by law, but what the law does is that they authorize the creation of this entity. Since the entity also follows private rules, it needs to be well, it needs to have a bylaws of its own, and the bylaws will establish the objective of the company, will establish the, the voting rules, will establish the governance structure. And these bylaws will then be registered with the company's register. So it's a mix of a public creation with private law procedures for incorporating a company, right? But the fact remains that it is created by law, it can only be terminated by law as well about the control of this company. So in this case, we're talking about here, and that may vary again from legal system to legal system. In this case, the social capital of that company is both public and private, but the state here will be the majority shareholder with voting rights. So in this case, it would be 51% for the state, and 49% could be open up uh, for private sector participation. Nevertheless, the entity is still independent, and the entity controls the revenues it receives for the services it provides, right? And also control the operational costs of the programs and activities it is executing. This is, an, this is also another very important feature for the private sector to see, essentially because most of the time the private sector is concerned that if the revenues go, let's say, to a public fund, linked to the treasury system of a state or of a, or of a municipality, they may not see how then this money will be dispersed at the end. So with this process, at least they can have an idea of how the money is being employed and how the money is being managed. So again, those are the features that I'm raising here just to somehow try to bring out what the private sector will look at, right? When we talk about assets, um, so, in most countries, this is not always the case, but in most countries, countries uh, red plus assets, emission reductions, if they take place in a public land or if the forest is public, the civil law system of that country normally or tends to assume that then the carbon embodied in that piece of land that is public also belongs to the state. When that is the case, Right? In situations where that is the case, not always like this, but in situations where this is the case, then the state is able to create the company by actually contributing its environmental assets, the ones that actually exist, the ones that actually have been verified, right, according to a certain methodology, according to a certain carbon standard. But they are able to contribute that asset into the company as its part or as its, as its participation within that company. To do that though, um, normally the, the law of the country will require that those assets be uh, undergo an economic evaluation and this is not an easy process, I agree, because establishing the price for carbon at this level, it is, as we know, as, as we have been discussing, it is quite difficult, but once you are able to surpass that phase, then those assets could be contributed into the company, integralized into the company. And of course, the state could, if it wishes to do so, transfer also the legal ownership it has over those environmental assets to the public entity that operates under the private law regime. Um, then after all this process, what will this entity be able to do? It will be able to sell, if you want to sell, uh, and negotiate and market those assets for, for which it holds the legal title. It will be able to keep those assets if you want to and, and create new companies, create the special purpose view companies with some entity in the private sector in order to invest in specific programs and projects. 
And they may also receive equity investments, meaning they may also sell shares to private entities who are willing to invest in the company and to invest in the activities that the company is carrying out. And the other possibility is to raise debt. The state can also do that with treasury bonds, but normally when you have a public entity with a private law regime, it will be able to do so uh, in a more flexible manner at least. So it will be able to issue bonds and it will be able to go to certain banks and say, listen, I have a certain volume of environmental assets and red plus assets, I could use that as collateral if you're willing to provide me finance for a certain amount. So it doesn't mean that that entity needs to undertake all those activities, but it's a menu of options you may choose from. So essentially to conclude, I think I have only five minutes left, um, the advantage here of this model, beyond the ones we have already spoken about, um, I think first of all, it reduced the dependence on public funding, right? We know that public funding is limited. So by giving those attributes to the Red Plus system, it is more likely that these companies will be able, although they will need some initial funding, some initial public funding, that they will be able to achieve financial sustainability in the mid to long term, right? It may also be said that it's well aligned better or well aligned, well aligned with the third phase of Red Plus, one that looks at uh, payment, uh, performance-based payments. We know that it operates in a more flexible way. Uh, therefore, it increases the pool of financing opportunities for that entity. And finally, the idea of having a corporation model coupled with the notion of management of environmental assets, and that we, we know is a new concept and a new economy that is being born out there. But that brings other set of, of advantages, which is for creating that company, there is no initial cash expenditure by the state. If the state has already some environmental assets and red plus assets or credits that have been somehow verified by a robust methodology, then it can use this to integralize its share of participation into that company. The other point is that the revenues for those activities, whenever they come, they will be separated from the revenues of the state. So it will be easier to have an oversight of how those uh, revenues are then spent and managed. And finally, that creates the opportunity to gain private sector know-how. Simply by working side by side with the private sector, there is a great chance that public entities will also learn uh, how to operate in markets that they haven't been operating before. Um, I think that's it. That's what I wanted to say. Uh, just one final comment which is those companies do not need to be created anew. They can be reformulated from existing companies. So we're not really suggesting that everyone starts creating new companies and additional bureaucracy, which is more costs. So it's essentially a way of looking of what institutions are out there that could perform similar services and making the right questions. For instance, is this institution you're looking at able to attract domestic or foreign private investment? Is this institution, for instance, able to, to carry out or execute programs and, and, and projects which are for the interest, the general interest of the public? Is this entity competent to deal with environmental conservation and, and sustainable rural production? So once you have this list of questions uh, set out, you might find some institution that will be able to be redesigned or just adjust a bit in order for it to function in a way that will be able to attract more private sector participation. Um, I guess that's it. I hope it was not too fast, too many technical details to, to cover.